So in this video, we're going to look at the effect of temperature on microbial growth, as well as steam sterilization. So last time, what we did was we took um, five broths, and for the five broths, we inoculated one organism into all five broths. So let's say you were given E. coli. Your job last time was to inoculate all five broths with E. coli, and then we placed them at a variety of temperatures. We placed one tube at five degrees. Remember that that was the refrigerator. We had one tube at 25, which was room temperature. We had another tube at 38, which is roughly close to human body temperature. We had one tube at 42 degrees, and we had another tube that was placed at 55. And so for each organism, they were placed at the five various temperatures. And what we're looking at is at which temperature did the microbes grow best? So what is the optimal temperature as well as what is the temperature range? Meaning at which temperatures do those microbes grow? And so now we're going to talk about what, are, what is the term for an organism that grows in a particular temperature range? And so we'll start with the first one. And the first one that we're going to talk about are the psychrophiles. Psychro refers to cold. File, lever. So a psychrophile is a cold lever. And so notice that it grows um, on the minimum end about minus 5. So it will grow um, uh, below freezing. On the maximum, it grows to about 15 or so. Um, and then optimally, it's going to grow best around refrigeration temperatures. And so organisms that would be psychrophiles are actually going to grow at refrigeration temperatures instead of normally being inhibited by them. And so those are our psychrophiles. Now, if we call an organism a psychrotroph, psychro is cold, troph is eater. So if we call an organism a psychrotroph, it still prefers cold temperatures, but it's warmer than a psychrophile. And so if we look at a psychrotroph, um, it grows to about, let's say, around zero approximately. Uh, maximum would be just below human body temperature. And notice that optimally, or where the peak is, is right around room temperature. So these organisms will grow at room temperature, they will grow at refrigeration temperature. So around five degrees, they can still grow. Um, however, they don't grow well at human body temperature. Next, we have our mesophiles. Meso, moderate. File, lever. So these are our moderate temperature levers. So these grow uh, minimally at about 15 degrees or so, uh, maximally at about 45. And notice that optimally, they grow best at human body temperature. So they grow best right around 37 degrees Celsius. So if we look at a mesophile, we would expect that it would grow at room temperature because room temperature would be about 25. We would expect that it would grow at human body temperature, so about 37 to 38, as well as growing possibly at 42 degrees as well. Next, we have our thermophiles. Thermo, what do you think thermo means? Thermo means heat. File is lever. So our thermophiles are our heat lovers. Notice that they will grow at about 42 being the minimum and up to almost 80 and then optimally around 60 or so. Now, when you're looking at these um, growth curves and you're looking at what temperatures they grow, what you need to realize is that when we call, let's say, an organism a mesophile, Notice that most mesophiles grow best around human body temperature, but that doesn't mean that all mesophiles grow best around human body temperature. It's just that their growth is going to fall within this range. 
And so some mesophiles, for example, might grow best at 42. Other mesophiles might grow best at um, 25 at room temperature, but their growth falls within that range. And so these peaks that you're seeing, these are like an average. So an average mesophile would grow best around 37. But what you need to realize is that within that category of being a mesophile, 37 is not always the optimal. It could be a little bit lower, it could be a little bit higher, but the growth range falls within that curve. And so that's just something you wanna think about when you're trying to figure out for each organism, what is their growth characteristic? If we call an organism an extreme thermophile, it's just like the name suggests, right? Extreme heat lover. These are organisms that grow very well at very high temperatures. And so minimally at about 65, maximum about 110 or so. Um, and again, optimally would be almost close to boiling. So between like 90 and 100 approximately. And so we're going to now talk about our data and talk about for our four organisms that we tested, where did we see growth? So the first one that we're gonna look at is the data for our first organism, which is gonna be Pseudomonas fluorescens. And so remember that in this experiment, again, you inoculated five broths, and those five broths were placed at the various temperatures. So you placed one at five degrees, which went in the refrigerator, one at 25, which was room temperature, one which was 38, that was an incubator that was set to um, simulate uh, human body temperature or close to it, uh, 42 and 55. And on the end here, you're seeing an uninoculated control, meaning that that tube has no bacteria in it and it's a point of comparison to compare the other tubes with. Now, just like we looked at for our data for um, the effect of pH on microbial growth and the effect of osmotic pressure on microbial growth, right? What we're essentially looking for is to indicate if the organism grew at a particular temperature, what we're looking for is the degree of turbidity. And remember that turbidity is the cloudiness. So the greater the turbidity or the greater the cloudiness, the more the microbe grew at that particular temperature. So if we look at Pseudomonas fluorescence and behind the tubes, remember we had our serological pipettes and the purpose again of that serological pipette being in the back is that we can try and look at the numbers through the tubes and see how clearly we can see those numbers. So like if I look at my uninoculated control, you can see that I can see the number one um, quite well. So put on my laser pointer. So you can see the number one very, very well. If I look at 55, notice that 55 degrees looks roughly the same. Notice that there's no turbidity um, obscuring the number. If I look at 42, it looks about the same. If I look at 38, it looks about the same. However, look at what it looks like for 25 and five. Notice that for 25 degrees Celsius, it has some turbidity. The number is obscured to an extent. And if I look at five degrees, the amount of turbidity is even greater. You can see that that number is harder to see and therefore the turbidity is greater and therefore the growth is greater. And so if we were to roughly quantitate the amount of turbidity um, in each of these, we might conclude something like this. So our six, or our five degrees Celsius has the most amount of growth. So we're gonna put this on a scale of uh, one being the lowest amount of growth, negative being no growth, or four pluses um, would be the most growth. So five degrees Celsius, we get the most growth. 25 degrees, we get a little bit less, right? We still have some turbidity, but not as much as the five degrees. Whereas when we look at 38, 42, and 55, we see no growth that's consistent with the uninoculated control. And so this shows us that Pseudomonas fluorescence grew best at five degrees. It also grew at 25. And so I want you to start thinking about 
based on those growths, based on the fact that it grew at refrigeration and it grew at room temperature, I want you to think about what is the name for the term for this organism's temperature growth. And we'll go over that and we'll put that in a table at the end. The next organism that we're going to talk about is serratia marcescens. And serratia marcescens, remember, is the organism that produces the pink slime in the shower. And so if I look at serratia marcescens, and again, I look at the various um, temperatures that we talked about, right? So 5 degrees, 25, 38, 42, 55, and the uninoculated control. Sorry about that. If we were to look at this, you'll notice that here's my uninoculated control. You can see the number quite, quite clearly. Uh, we can still see the number well at 55. 42, we have some turbidity. 38 and 25, we have a high degree of turbidity. Notice that for both of these um, temperatures, 25 and 38, you can see that the organism grew quite well. If I look at 5, notice that the organism did not grow. The turbidity is not present. So if I were to put the amount of growth on here, I would have that at 25 degrees and 38. It's roughly equivalent, right? They both have a high degree of turbidity. 42, you could give it a negative or potentially even a 1 plus. It might have a small degree of turbidity, but not nearly to the extent as 25 and 38. Um, 5 degrees was nothing. 55 degrees was nothing. Those both looked like our uninoculated control. Now, the other thing to realize is that if you look at the way that the bacteria grew at 25 versus 38, you'll notice something very interesting. And that is that the 25 degrees, if I look at the growth, you'll notice that the bacteria is producing this red or pink pigment. And so it only produces this pigment when grown at room temperature. If cultured at human body temperature, it does not produce that red pigment. And so that's why the 38, you don't see the red, but at the 25, you do see it um, because at that temperature, the bacteria is going to produce that pigment. And so this is why you see the pink slime in the shower. Serratia marcescens is an organism that produces glycocalyx. It makes the bacteria sticky and it likes room temperature. So in a shower where it's very damp, um, and the temperature is um, pretty consistent, you'll notice that um, the organism grows and it produces that reddish pink pigment. And so again, you want to start thinking about what is the term for serratia marcescens? Is it a psychrotroph? Is it a mesophile? Etc. And again, we'll come back to that in just a minute. But notice that for this one, it grew best at 25 and 38. The next organism that we're going to look at is going to be E. coli. And so if we compare the uninoculated control with our various temperatures, what you'll notice is that 55 has no growth, 5 degrees has no growth, the highest amount of growth is about human body temperature. We still see quite a bit of growth at 20 or 42, sorry, excuse me. And we still see quite a bit of growth at 25. So if I put that on here, right, 38 would be the highest. So we give that four pluses. 42 would be a little bit less. 25 would be the least. And so now if you think about it, E. coli growing best at human body temperature, does that make sense to you conceptually? And the answer should be yes, because it's normal habitat or where you normally would find E. coli is in the gut of humans. And then the last organism that we have is Bacillus sterothermophilus. And so if we look at the growth for Bacillus sterothermophilus, again on the right we have our uninoculated control. Notice that if I look at this, there's no growth at 5, there's no growth at 25, there's no growth at 38, there's no growth at 42. However, there is growth at 55. So if we put that on here, 55 is going to have growth but notice that it did not grow at any of the lower temperatures. And again, you're gonna to wanna to think about what is the name 
for that type of organism. So if we put all our data together, again, just a reminder, we tested four bacteria, Pseudomonas fluorescens, Serratia marcescens, E. coli, and Bacillus derythermophilus. And so if we look at our data for Pseudomonas fluorescens, notice that it grew best around five degrees, um, a little bit less at 25, not at 38, not at 42, um, and not at 55. And so based on that growth pattern, what would you call Pseudomonas fluorescens in terms of its effective temperature on microbial growth? And so if you said it's a psychrotroph, that would be correct. Um, it's not a psychrophile because it does grow at 25. It's not a mesophile because it grows at 5, right? And so that leaves that it's a psychrotroph. It's a cold eater. It grows best um, in cooler temperatures, so around either refrigeration temperatures or room temperature, but again, not at human body temperature. Now, based on the fact that it doesn't grow well at human body temperature, most psychrotrophs are not pathogens. And so Pseudomonas fluorescens, the one that we used in class, is not a pathogen. However, there are pathogenic um, psychrotropes. And an example of this, and one that we talked about in the lecture, is Listeria monocytogenes. And Listeria monocytogenes causes, causes listeriosis. And so remember that cows also get listeriosis, so it's transmitted often um, through unpasteurized dairy products, um, also through deli meats. And remember that the general population is not as at risk for listeriosis. However, if um, a patient is immunocompromised, so their immune system is not functioning properly, um, or if a female is pregnant, um, the fetus is at risk if contracting listeriosis. Um, and that's because listeriosis in patients who are immunocompromised or in fetuses um, can lead to meningitis, it can lead to sepsis, and it has a higher mortality rate in those populations. And so that's for Listeria monocytogenes. Pseudomonas fluorescence, notice the name is fluorescence. What that tells you is that this bacteria is bioluminescent. It produces a pigment that allows it to fluoresce under certain wavelengths of light. And in the next slide, I'll show you some examples of um, plates that have been streaked with Pseudomonas fluorescence and placed under fluorescent lamps. And you can see that in fact, this bacteria does grow and it does fluoresce. So the next one that we're gonna talk about is the Serratia marcescens. And again, notice that it grew best at 25 and 38. When it grew at 25, it produces that pink or red pigment and it did not produce that pigment at 38. Serratia did not grow at five degrees. It did not grow at 42. It did not grow at 55. So what would be the term for Serratia marcescens? So it can't be a psychrotroph because it does not grow at five, but it grew at 38. So we can't be, can't be a psychrotroph. So that means that Serratia marcescens is a mesophile. So this is a mesophile or a moderate lover. Um, Serratia marcescens is what we refer to as an opportunistic pathogen. And what that means is that in healthy individuals, Serratia marcescens doesn't um, tend to pose much of a risk. However, for certain groups of individuals, again, immunocompromised, for example, um, certain groups of people um, are at risk for Serratia marcescens. Um, it can cause urinary tract infections, it can cause pneumonia, it can cause meningitis. Um, it creates or it causes a variety of different conditions um, in patients who are immunocompromised. Next, we have our E. coli or our Escherichia coli. E. coli grew best at 38, um, a little bit less at 42, and a little bit less at 25. And so if we look at E. coli, 
what would be the term to describe it. And again, just like serratia, it would be a mesophile. It grows best at moderate temperatures. It doesn't grow at 55, right? 55 is too high. It does not grow at 5. 5 is too low, so refrigeration temperature, not going to grow. But around human body temperature. One of the things to notice is if you look at where the bacteria grew at what temperatures for E. coli and compare that to serratia, you'll notice something different. And that is that they have different optimal ranges. And that is E. coli tends to like human body temperature and possibly even a little higher. Whereas serratia marcescens likes human body temperature and a little bit cooler. So they're both mesophiles. They both grow best around human body temperature, but they don't have the same ranges in terms of where they grow. But they are in fact both still mesophiles. If we look at the types of diseases that E. coli causes, right? Um, e. coli is the cause of sepsis, so bloodborne illness. Um, it's the cause of a urinary tract infection. And again, in fact, about 90% of all UTIs are caused by E. coli. And when we do our urinary tract cultures um, and we talk about those, you'll learn why E. coli causes the most UTIs. Um, it causes diarrhea, right? It causes foodborne illness. If you're talking about the O157H7, um, it can lead to kidney failure, especially if um, a UTI progresses to kidney failure, et cetera. And so E. coli is linked with a variety of different diseases. And then lastly, we have our Bacillus sterothermophilus. And if we look at our data for Bacillus sterothermophilus, the only temperature that it grew was at 55. It did not grow at 5, did not grow at 25, did not grow at 38, 42, but only grew at 55. So what would be the term for that type of growth? And the answer is that it's a thermophile. So it grows best at higher temperatures. Again, just like psychotrophs, um, for thermophiles, thermophiles are not usually pathogenic, and that's because they don't grow well at human body temperature. And so Bacillus sterothermophilus is not a human pathogen. It doesn't cause disease, and that's because it doesn't grow at human body temperature. So these are the plates. Um, these plates were made by Dwi Pham at OCC, our lab technician. And so what he did was he inoculated these plates um, with Pseudomonas fluorescence. And then you can see once they grew, um, if we put them under uh, fluorescent lamps, you can see that in fact the bacteria is bioluminescent, it grows, and you can see the characters that he's drawn here. Um, we have Yoda, we have SpongeBob, we have a cat, we have DNA, etc. And so this is just to show you Pseudomonas fluorescence, the one that we used. It's not pathogenic, but it is a cool organism because it is bioluminescent. So the next activity that we're going to talk about is our steam sterilization. And we're talking about that with the temperature experiment because they kind of go hand in hand and you'll see why in just a minute. So the purpose of our steam sterilization is to determine if the autoclave is working properly to sterilize instruments, media, etc. And so what the autoclave is, as you can see in the picture of it on the right, the autoclave is basically a big pressure cooker. It uses pressurized steam to get the temperature above 100 degrees. And so the operating conditions, the minimum operating conditions that need to happen in order for um, us to assume that the, or the items are sterile, the minimum operating conditions would be 120 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes at 15 pounds per square inch, which is the amount of pressure. So if the autoclave runs at those conditions, the items that are in the autoclave should be sterile. Now let's talk about why that might be important. So let's talk about media, right? And we've talked about how we make nutrient auger. 
And so you take the powder, right? And we dissolve it in the water. And in order to get the powder to go into solution, the powder has to be heated to above 100, right? So we need it to boil in order for, um, in order for the powder to dissolve. So when we do this, what we do is we take that powder, dissolve it in the water, put it in a flask, cover the flask, loosely cover the flask, put the flask into the autoclave, and we run the autoclave for those minimum operating conditions. Now, doing that serves twofold. One, it gets the temperature above 100 so that the auger will dissolve, and two, it also is there to help sterilize the auger. And the reason for that is remember that nutrient auger is a nutrient rich media. If you don't sterilize that nutrient auger and then you inoculate that plate and you put it in the incubator, anything that was in the auger would grow. And so if we want to do experiments, we need to make sure that our nutrient auger is sterile so that when we inoculate it, the only thing that grows is what we've inoculated onto the plate. Now, in terms of sterilize, what does sterilize mean? Well, sterilize is to kill all living organisms. So all types of organisms. So mycobacterium, endospore producing bacteria, uh, vegetative cells, etc. So when we talk about sterilization, we're removing all microbial contamination. That is different than other types of controls of microbial growth, like sanit uh, to sanitize is to reduce microbial number, but it's not getting rid of everything. When we talk about sterilization, it's to kill all microbial growth. So when we talk about sterilizing, we're talking about getting rid of all forms of microbial growth, all living um, cells. So if we want to ensure that our autoclave is working properly, we can do a test to see if in fact our autoclave is sterilizing what's in it. And so to do this, we take what's called a killet ampule. And you're gonna see a picture of this in, in a moment, um, what those killet ampules look like. But we take these killet ampules and in the killet ampules, are Bacillus sterothermophilus um, endospores. Now, there's a reason that we use Bacillus sterothermophilus endospores. If you think about what you learned about um, endospores, right? Endospores are structures made of keratin and they're very heat resistant, right? And so when we did our endospore stain, for example, in order to get the uh, malachite green into the endospores, Remember, what did we have to do to our slides to get the malachite green in? And you might recall that we had to steam our slides and the steam allowed the malachite green to go in. So endospores though are very heat resistant, right? They're very heat resistant and therefore we can conclude that if the autoclave is able to kill endospores, it's able to destroy endospores, which are the most resistant to heat. Um, if it's able to kill endospores, we can conclude that all other types of organisms should have died during that process as well. Because again, endospores would be the most resistant. So we take our ampule, we put it in our autoclave, and we run it under the minimum operating conditions. After we run it through the autoclave, we take that killet ampule and we incubate it at 55 degrees for 48 hours. Now the purpose of that, and we saw this in the temperature experiment, is that Bacillus sterothermophilus grew best at 55 degrees. So we're now taking that ampule and we're putting it into its ideal condition. Now conditions are favorable. So if the endospores survived, and we put that ampule at 55, they're gonna germinate, they're gonna start reproducing, and they're gonna grow within the killet ampule. And I'll show you in a minute how that's detected. On the flip side, if our autoclave is working properly and it's sterilizing what's in the incubator, 
Our kill it ampule, if we run it through the autoclave and it's working, the autoclave should have killed the endospores. And if we take that kill it ampule and we put it at 55, because the endospores died, the bacteria wouldn't grow. And so we use the kill it ampules as a way to determine if sterilization was achieved. And so let's look at how that is accomplished. So now let's talk about what is in our kill it ampule. So this is our recipe for the kill it ampule. And so what's in the um, kill it ampule are Bacillus sterothermophilus endospores. And that's because this is a heat resistant organism. Meaning that because endospores are made of keratin, right, they're very resistant to heat because Bacillus sterothermophilus would produce endospores in response to harsh conditions like heat. So um, these endospores would be used because they are heat resistant. And again, if the autoclave can kill the endospores, we would assume that any other organism that might be in there would also die um, as well. Next, we have our bromocrestle purple. Bromocrestle purple, you might recall, is our pH indicator. And now think back to other tests. What other test have we done that has bromocrestle purple? So think about it for a minute. If you need to pause, pause, because it's good to think about. Bromocrestle purple, remember, was also in our decarboxylase experiment. Right, It was in our decarboxylase experiment as our pH indicator. And what color is acidic? Yellow is acidic. And remember that's true for almost all of our pH indicators. So bromocrystal purple, yellow is acidic. Uh, bromothymol blue, yellow is acidic. Phenyl red, yellow is acidic. The exception to this, remember, is methyl red. Methyl red is the exception to yellow is acidic. Methyl red is the opposite of phenyl red. Methyl red is red when acidic, but all our other pH indicators, yellow is acidic. Now, notice the name is bromocrystal purple, and again, that color at the end there indicates the alkaline color. So purple is going to be alkaline or basic. Again, bromothymol blue, blue is alkaline. Phenyl red, red is alkaline. Bromocrystal purple, purple is alkaline. So that's our pH indicator. And then we have our glucose, and this is there for fermentation. And so if organism survives, it will ferment glucose and produce, what are the pH of the products like if the sugar is used as a food source? And produce acidic products. So it will decrease the pH. So again, the way that this experiment is going to work is this tube here on this edge, this is the control. That's what the kilid ampule would look like before autoclave. And that's the same for this one beneath it. Okay, so this is what it would look like uh, before the autoclave. Right, so we take our kill it ampule, we run it through a cycle in the autoclave, and when we run it through a cycle in the autoclave, right, if the, ba if the bacteria survives, if the endospores survive, and we now take that kill it ampule, 
and we incubate it at 55. Remember that 55 is the optimal temperature for Bacillus derythermophilus. So if the endospores survived, they are going to, if they survive, they need a food source. They're going to use the glucose as a food source. And so if the organism survives, it's going to use the glucose as a food source. It's going to start to ferment the glucose. It's going to produce the acidic products and it's going to turn yellow. So if we see yellow, yellow is acidic, and that means that glucose was fermented. So the glucose was fermented. So if the kilodampule at the end of this is yellow, is, does that tell you, was steam sterilization achieved or not? So meaning, was it sterilized? And the answer is not sterile. So if at the end of this experiment, if you end up with a kilodampule that is yellow, right? So either the glass one or the one in our book, okay? If it's yellow, it tells us that the pH is acidic. If it's acidic, it tells us that the glucose was fermented. And the only way that the glucose was fermented is if the organism was able to survive the autoclave. And so what that tells us, if it's yellow, is that it's not sterile, meaning the items that were in the autoclave during that cycle cannot be considered to be sterile because the endospores and the kilodampule were able to survive. So yellow is going to tell us that it's not sterile. The autoclave did not work properly. It was not able to sterilize the items in the autoclave. On the other hand, if it's purple, purple is alkaline. Um, that tells us that glucose was not fermented. Which tells us that it's sterile. Right? Organism died in the autoclave. So if at the end of this experiment, if the killid ampule is still purple, that is considered a positive for sterilization, meaning that our autoclave worked properly, it did sterilize whatever was in that cycle because it was able to kill the endospores. Now, in the example in your book, it's the middle tube that demonstrates this. Notice it's purple. The one in the book has an added layer to it. It has this little strip on it that indicates also um, if the autoclave is um, working properly. So notice that that strip started out blue. And if the autoclave cycle ran, notice that little strip is now gray. In the lab, we often use what's called autoclave tape. It's a special tape that has stripes on it. And normally those stripes are white. But when it runs through the autoclave, those strips or those stripes will turn black, which tells us that whatever has that tape on it that has the black, that tells us that that has run through the autoclave. Um, and so that's just an added layer. But the best indication would be to do the killid ampule to see if the endospores were able to um, survive or not. And so that's our steam sterilization. So this is basically checking to see if the autoclave is working properly.